Lord Jesus, it was neat to hear reports about what prayer is doing. Actually, I guess prayer is not doing it. You are. The prayers are just going up to heaven and they're being heard. And we thank you for encouraging us to call out to you. I'm calling out to you right now, asking once again for the Holy Spirit. In John 3, you told Nicodemus that unless the Holy Spirit gives us spiritual eyes and ears, we won't get it. We want to get it tonight. So we pray for that help from heaven. And again, I pray that you rebuke Satan's power to distract. He likes to try and get in the way. And I just pray that you'd crowd him out. Anoint us, I pray, with your spirit. For Jesus' sake, amen. You've heard of prayer partners. Prayer partners. Actually, tonight, my subject matter is going to be praying for others or intercessory prayer. But before I get there, I want to do a little short little thing on prayer partners. Uh, my prayer partners are going to be a little different than you were thinking. Um, the prayer is just one of three fundamental ingredients that go into a daily personal walk with Christ. We have a three-legged stool up here representing the three components of a relationship. It's called a relationship stool. This is a relationship with Jesus we're talking about now. Relationship with Jesus is not something that happens by accident. It requires intentional um, time you spend with him on a daily basis. Um, going to church once a week and praying before you eat food is not what it means to be a Christian. It's far more involved than that. Uh, it, this is not, we're not talking about something that should be overwhelming. It is a privilege to have a personal acquaintance with Jesus. It's a privilege to be invited to spend time with him daily. It is such a privilege that the devil will do everything he can to keep you from it. Everything he can. It is the single most important thing you can do. Pursuing a personal relationship with Jesus on a daily basis. And that relationship is built around three tangible things. So here they are, three-legged stool. Uh, the first one is Bible study for the purpose of getting to know Jesus. Underscore that. This is not Bible study to prove things to anybody. This is not Bible study so that you can con convince people that you have the truth and that if they want to be on the winning side of the debate, they'll sign up with you. This is a whole different kind of Bible study. We're talking about relationship with Jesus. This is a Bible study to meet him and to know him better. So obviously you're going to be spending some particular time in your Bible around the places where Jesus is most readily apparent. And those are, for beginnings, those are Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Go to the Gospels. As you become more acquainted with Jesus in his Gospels, then you'll start seeing him popping up between the lines and back of every phrase throughout the Scriptures. But you should always have time for him in his Word and particularly in the Gospels. So that's the first leg of the three-legged stool. The second leg of the three-legged stool is prayer, but it is prayer for the purpose of communion. This is a relationship stool we're talking about. This is a daily, personal, interactive relationship between you and the Lord Jesus. And so you don't simply make requests. You communicate as friend with friend. And that's a big difference. It's not just, Lord, help that policeman not to give me a speeding ticket. You know, Lord, help me find my keys. You know, this is Prayer for the purpose of communion. Relation. Probably if there's one word that, goes, that, that could be used as essential or, or pivotal in all relationships, it's communication. That's the most fundamental word in relationships. And so here we have it in the relationship with Jesus. It's communication for the purpose of knowing him better and sharing with him. These are prayer partners. See, prayer is one of them, but there are two partners, Bible study. And then the third one is sharing with others what you have been discovering as you spend time in the first two. So as you spend time with Jesus in his word and in communion with him through prayer, then you have something to share. And quite frankly, if you're not doing that, you have nothing to share. And to think about witnessing when you aren't spending time with Jesus daily in communion and in fellowship, to think about witnessing, that's just ludicrous. You have nothing to witness. If you were to go to court and they asked you to testify about the traffic accident and you said, well, actually, Your Honor, I was in another country when that happened. They'd say, well, why are you here? Well, you asked for witnesses. Well, yeah, but you didn't see it. No, but, you know, I want to be a witness. You may leave now, you know. 
you're not a witness unless you've spent time there, all right? So you've got to have time with Jesus in order to have something to say about him. You have to be at the table in order to pass the bread. But if you're at the table, you'll have bread to pass. You will. The bread of life will be fresh for you. you will, there's a song we used to sing at summer camp, Jesus' love keeps bubbling over. You'll become carbonated. As you spend time with Jesus, you'll become carbonated. You'll become contagious. You will find that you have things to say about your friend Jesus. And when you talk about your friend Jesus, that has a way of impacting people like nothing else does. Nothing compares to the personal testimony of what Jesus means to you and what you've discovered you mean to Jesus. Nothing. No. There's no proof, proof texts that you can give people that will have as much impact on them as your own testimony of what Jesus is doing in your life. So, you don't want a one-legged stool. I know they used to use them for milking, but prayer is not made to, intended to be a one-legged stool. It's a three-legged stool that we're talking about here. And so if you involve yourself in the three components on a daily basis for the purpose of knowing him, that's what our All About Jesus Revival Seminar is all about. It's about this relationship and growing it more meaningfully. And I just gave you a quick little plug for the three components in your life. But now I said I want to talk about intercessory prayer. Why pray for others? Why pray for anybody, actually? Um, what difference does it make? Um, maybe you could say, well, it'd make a difference if they knew you were praying. You know, someone says, I'm praying for you, and you say, oh, that's, that's nice. You know, it make, makes me feel good to know you're praying for me. It might make that kind of a difference. Maybe some sort of a psychological benefit. But what if you were praying for them and they didn't know you were praying for them? Of what value is that? How does it help? How could it help? Why would it help? Um, if they don't know you're praying, does it make any difference? I uh, had a friend named Don. He died last year of cancer. But uh, when I was pastoring in a church in Auburn, Washington, it was a Seventh-day Adventist high school was associated with that church. It was called the Auburn Academy Church. And my children attended that school. Um, and one day Don uh, was talking to me at a uh, prayer group. We had a men's prayer group that met on Sunday mornings at 6 a.m. We called it Power Start. And uh, he said, I tried an experiment yesterday in church. I said, oh, really? He said, yeah, he said, I was sitting towards the back, and um, our Sabbath services included 300 academy students, high school age kids. And he said, uh, there was a row of academy students sitting right in front of me. He said, I'd just been reading about praying for people, praying for others. And for some reason, I just thought, you know, Maybe this would be kind of a neat experiment to, uh, to do with prayer this, this morning here in church. He said, before you started preaching, the, this row of guys, academy students, probably 15, 16 years old, they were talking to each other. They were goofing around. They were distracted. They were reading. They were writing notes. They were laughing. They were, you know, as the service was underway, they weren't really engaged. Then he said, when you stood up to preach, the four who were directly in front of me slouched down in their pew, put their heads back against the edge of the pew, and closed their eyes. Obviously tuning out. It's like, okay, it's time to sleep. I'm going to take a nap until this guy's done. And I thought to myself, I'm going to pray. I'm not going to pray for all four of them because I'm doing an experiment. I'm just going to pray for two of the four. So he said, I picked two of the four, and I started praying. He said, I started praying that the Lord would stir their hearts to want to hear, and that they would sit up, and that they would listen, and that not only would they listen, but that as they listened, that they would hear with the heart, and not just their ears, and that something would go deep for them. He said, I hadn't been praying for five minutes when they both sat up. The other two stayed down. They sat up. I kept praying. They leaned forward. I kept praying. They put their elbows on their knees and their chins in their hands, and they watched everything you said and did. 
And as you moved around on the platform, they moved with you. He said, I kept praying. They were engaged all the way through the service to the very end. He said, it sent chills down my spine. He says, incidentally, he said, one of the two's name was Chris Venden. <laughs> it's my own son. When he said he'd been praying for my son, I gave him a hug. And I said, thank you, Don. Thank you for praying for my son. That was oh, 18 years ago. Three years ago, we were speaking at the camp meeting in Palmer, Alaska. Uh, Don and his wife lived in Auburn, Washington. That's thousands of miles away from Palmer, Alaska. And after I had um, preached one of the meetings, I, I was down shaking hands with people, and lo and behold, here's Don. I said, Don, I haven't seen you for 12 years. What are you doing? He says, we just finished driving the Alcan Highway, and we're on our way back. And we heard that you were speaking at Palmer, and it was sort of en route for us, and we decided we'd come by and spend the Sabbath here. And so, yeah, that's why we're here, on our way home. I said, Don, when I see you, I can't think of you without thinking about you praying for my son. That just meant so much to me when you told me that story. He said, Lee, just hang on a minute. He went over. He said, well, come with me. I walked with him to his motor home. He went inside. He came back out. He had a three-ring binder. He said, I want to show you my prayer list. He opened it up, page one. First 10 names, one of them was Chris Venden. He said, I'm still praying for your son. I'm still praying for your son. 15 years later. He died last year. But you know what I think? I think he has a prayer account in heaven that's drawing interest. And his prayers are still going forth. Does prayer work? See, that's the question, why pray for anybody? Um, we asked the question at a prayer meeting in a little country church where I first started pastoring, first place I ever pastored, little country church in Colorado, and um, an agricultural community. And we were talking about, does prayer work? And uh, somebody said, well, let's pray. Let's just do an experiment. Let's just pray for somebody. And see what happens. So they said, well, who should we pray for? Well, they consensus and talked a little bit together, and they came up with a name. They said, there's a, a physician in our town who used to be a Seventh-day Adventist. But he hasn't been here for 20 years. He ended up having an affair with a woman and losing his marriage and getting remarried. And he became, this is a small community. This is like Mayberry RFD. Everybody's business is everybody else's, even if it shouldn't be. And he felt so self-conscious and awkward about the messes of his life that he just started staying away from church. And he hasn't been in church. still practices medicine here. He's one of the only doctors in our valley, but he doesn't come to church. Could we pray for him, they said. I said, let's do it. So our little group began praying for Dr. Ted. And we said, we're going to do this multiple times daily. And we're not going to quit. We're not going to set a time. We're just going to do it. Two weeks later, he showed up in church after 20 years of not being in church. Two weeks later, Dr. Ted shows up in church. Well, you could ask this question. Is God fair to bless someone who's been prayed for when other people aren't being prayed for? Whoa. I mean, how does that work? And so for help on this question, I want us to take a look at four texts. 2 Timothy 4, verse 8. Now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous... I'm sorry that yellow is not real legible, but 
judge will award to me on that day. Here's another one, 1 John 2, 1. If anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. What is an advocate? Well, an advocate is another name for a lawyer or an attorney or the defense or an intercessor or a mediator. That's what an advocate is, right? A couple more scriptures. Isaiah 53, 12. He bore the sin of many and he made what? Intercession for the transgressors. Here's another one. 1 Timothy 2, 5. For there is one God and one what? Mediator between God and men. And that man is Christ Jesus. So, um, Jesus is mediator, intercessor, advocate, and judge. How does this tie in with prayer? Well, some reasons for intercession. Prayer can free God's hands. Um, can God do something when we pray that he could not do otherwise? Well, a judge or lawyer would be considered out of bounds if they took a case that had not been appealed to them. Right? Um, when I was a, I was a school teacher for a number of years before I was a pastor. I came to school early one day. I happened to be just coming from my car and towards the administration building and uh, I saw a pickup truck come driving into the parking lot. I recognized the truck. It belonged to the father of a girl who was a student of mine. And uh, this was a high school. And the truck pulled up and stopped. There was no other car in the parking lot, just this truck. The truck came to a screeching halt, a very abrupt halt. And it caught my attention because it was sort of skidding as it came to a stop. I looked over and I saw the man behind the wheel lean across the seat and hit his daughter in the head. Bam! I saw her head hit the wall of the truck as a result of the blow. So it's kaboom and she goes bam against the window. And that wasn't all. He pulled his hand back, and he started hitting her again, in the head, in the face. Bam, he's hitting her in the face. Bam, and her head's going bam, bam, bam. She tried to open the door to get out of the truck, to run from him. He opened his door, raced around, slammed the door on her, shoving her back in the car. Opened the door and started hitting her again. There is nothing a 14-year-old girl can do that deserves that. Amen. Nothing. I was so angry, I ran. Well, first of all, I told you I was walking, but now as I'm remembering the story, I wasn't walking yet. I was just pulling in. And I brought my car directly over and parked it in front of his so that he couldn't get past me. And I jumped out of the car, and I rushed over to him and told him, what do you think you're doing? Leave her alone. And he jumped back in the pickup truck, slammed it in reverse, squealed out of the parking lot, and drove away with her. I was shaking. I was trembling. I was so angry what I had just seen. I called Child Protective Services immediately from the school office. I told them what I had just seen. I told them that something needed to be done. They said they'd get on it. And do you know what happened? You probably do. They went to the house. The girl had iced her face. They asked to see her. Her father was there. They asked her if she'd been having any problems earlier that morning that she'd like to talk with them about. They had received a call. She said, no, she was fine. Everything was fine. They said, are you sure? Because we received a call from someone who said they'd seen you being beaten by your father. No, she said, everything's fine. I'm not sure why anybody called you, but everything's fine. Child Protective Services called me later in the morning, they said, sir, thank you for your report. We actually believe that you were telling the truth. But the girl refuses to ask for help. And our hands are tied. We can't do anything at this point. She's a teenager. They couldn't take 
the case because the girl was unwilling to appeal to them. So, uh, a judge or lawyer would be out of bounds to take a case that has not been appealed to them. Now, um, we just noted Jesus as mediator, intercessor, advocate, and judge. Further, uh, if they did take a case that had not been appealed to them, the first thing that the prosecution would do would be to l tell them they were out of bounds. The prosecutor would say, you can't defend them. They didn't ask to be defended. Well, there's a prosecutor. There's an enemy, Satan. So when we appeal cases to God, it enables him to do something that he could not do otherwise. Because if the, de if the devil says, wait a minute, you can't, you can't, you can't, he says, oh, no, no, I'm just here on request. I've been appealed to, and I'm just answering the, the request. Now, I think it's very important for us to notice the difference between what prayer can do and what prayer can't do when it comes to others. It's a, I think this is a very important distinction. So I want to give a little time to that. It's important to notice this difference that prayer can make and also the difference it cannot make. When it comes to eternal life, God will never make someone's destiny based on what someone else did or didn't do for them. Very important that we understand this. God will never make somebody else's eternal destiny based on, on whether or not his decision will not be based on whether or not someone else prayed for them. Um, he is a God of love, and he is responsible for you being born in a world of sin. You didn't ask to be born. None of us did. He is the author of life. He realizes that you got born in this world without your permission. And because he is the author of life, he accepts the responsibility for you. And he will not place the responsibility for your eternal life on any one person on the planet. There's nobody else who's responsible for your eternal life. And he is going to make himself responsible to make sure that you have an adequate chance to understand who he is and what he wants to do for you. He'll make himself responsible to give everyone an adequate chance. John 1.9 says that Jesus was the true light which lights every man that comes into the world. Hindu? Muslim? Every man. He is the true light which lights every man that comes into the world. Now, there's a couple of confusions that many churches have struggled with this. Um, my own Seventh-day Adventist church has struggled with it too, confused with this, regarding the destiny of others. Um, one of the confusions that we have struggled with is that if we, uh, that, we need, that we need to finish the work and that there will be people who will be lost for eternity if we don't. I couldn't disagree with that more heartily. Um, I want you to try and imagine for just a moment a scene, a final judgment scene, all right? And let's just say you are on the right side of the fence. I'm going to turn that off. You are inside the city, and you have a neighbor who is on the outside. And your neighbor says, is it all right to ask questions? And God says, yes, please, what is your question? And the neighbor says, I see that Lee Vinden is there. He was my neighbor. I see he's there on the inside. And God says, yes. So, well, did he know something that he could have told me about how to get there? Because, you know, I... I never heard from him. Now, can you imagine God saying before the onlooking universe, hey, you know, we're real sorry about that. Yeah, Lee was supposed to have shared that with you, but he dropped the ball, you know. 
you win a few, you lose a few. I'm sorry that you're not going to make it, but we had hoped that Lee was going to do a better job in sharing with his neighbor, and he dropped the ball with you. Quite frankly, it's a little disappointing that he did, but you know, best to you, you know? Hope the final destruction goes quickly for you. Can you imagine God talking like that? Can you imagine him being served for eternity? Happily by people who said, wait a minute now, are you telling me that Jesus came out of the tomb and he said, all power is given unto me in heaven and in earth, but if Lee Venden drops the ball, we're going to have to lose a few. No, no, no. If all power is given to him in heaven and earth, he is not going to make someone else's eternal salvation based on whether or not Lee Venden does the right job. He's going to get to people in spite of Lee Venden. If he can't get to people in spite of Lee Venden, he is a wimpy God, and he ought to just take in his sign and quit calling himself the king. I mean, think about it. Seriously. You know, one of the things that Seventh-day Adventists have done, and they're not the only ones, many, many Protestant churches have done the same thing, They've taken issue, way back with Martin Luther, in fact, they've taken issue with the Roman Catholic Church's idea that the papacy can confer salvation. And they have said, Protestant churches for years have said, there's something not right about that. A human being just isn't in the position to decide who's saved and who's not saved. You don't confess to a human being and have him give you absolution. You go direct with God. Well, <clears throat> Protestant churches have said that for years. But now just think about this for a moment. If there would be someone lost for eternity because I failed to take the good news to them, then their salvation was based upon my doing my job. They were depending on a man instead of on God. And all of a sudden, I have conferred papal power and authority on myself. And I've told my church, if you don't go out and share, people will be lost for eternity. And they go out guilt-ridden because they don't want to have people lost for eternity because they didn't do their job. But wait a minute, who gave you papal authority to decide who's going to be saved and lost, whether you do your job or not? You see what I'm saying? If we're going to say that the papacy doesn't have the right to confer uh, salvation, what makes us think that our getting the job done is going to make a difference in terms of eternal life? It can't, or we'd be having papal authority too. So, and just by the way, incidentally, are you aware that God doesn't need us to finish the work anyway? Are you aware of that? You know, if he wants to, he can use angels. If he wants to, he can use visions and dreams and speak to people directly in their minds. If he wants to, Jesus said he could turn the stones into voices and then get the job done with them. So if, if God can use inanimate nature and if he can use visions and dreams and if he can use angels, then he doesn't need us. So when we say we've got to finish the work so he can come, I think that's rather either confused or rather arrogant because he's not depending on us to get it done. And when he actually does finish the work, are you aware the Bible says he does it himself? We don't. Romans 9, 28, he's going to finish the work. He's the one who's going to cut it short in righteousness because the Lord's going to make a short work upon the earth. We've been told the final movements will be what? Rapid ones. When the Lord finally steps up and says the time has come, we're going to get it done, he's going to do it in spite of us. In spite of us. He's not waiting for us. If he was waiting for us, he would be waiting forever because we won't get it done. Are you aware that every second three people are born and one person dies on the planet? Every second. Are you aware that all the Christian churches and denominations together are not keeping up with the birth rate on this planet when it comes to leading people to Jesus? Together, let alone one Seventh-day Adventist church. All the churches combined aren't getting the job done. And they aren't even keeping up with the birth rate. If God doesn't step in and do it, it's not going to get done by people. Well, so people say, well, whew, we don't have to witness anymore. <laughs> oh, oh, no, no. 
No. If in your mind, have to witness is a phrase, then you don't understand witness. It's not a have to. It's a privilege. It's a privilege. Anybody who thinks it's a have to isn't experiencing the three-legged stool I was just talking about yet. They're not having a personal, meaningful, intimate relationship with Jesus or they would understand that it just bubbles out of you. When you know Jesus, you want to tell other people about your friend. When I first met my wife, um, well, actually, it wasn't my wife when I met her, but when I first met Margie, um, we talked for three and a half hours in the college library. And uh, I went back to my dorm room that night, and I told my roommate, I just met this most awesome girl, and I'm talking about her, and my roommate's going, man, I think you are gone, you know? <laughs> you, you, are, you are smitten. Meanwhile, I find out later, Margie went to her dorm room and she told her roommate all about this guy she just met. And her roommate said, you think you're going to marry him? And she said, well, you know, it probably sounds pretty strange because we just met, but there's something in my gut that says I think we're going to get married. Okay, what happened? We were both so excited about the relationship that we had just experienced that we couldn't wait to tell somebody else. I got to tell somebody. Oh, guess what? I met this girl. See? When you're excited about a personal relationship with Jesus, people don't have to guilt you into talking about him. They don't have to leverage you into talking about him. They don't have to try and persuade or convince you that you need to do this. When you're excited about Jesus, you can't keep quiet. It bubbles over. I said there were two confusions. The other confusion is people say, well, wait a minute, though. Wait a minute. You said that, that, that nobody's going to be lost if we don't do the job because God's going to take the responsibility for that himself. But we have read statements that talk about millions going down into Christless graves. So how do you explain that, Lee? Millions going down into Christless graves. It's actually a lot easier to explain than you might think. We have assumed that a Christless grave means they're lost. No. A Christless grave means they went into their grave having never met Jesus personally. But that doesn't mean they're lost. Let me read you something. This is really cool. <laughs> From the book Christ Object Lessons. In the depths of heathenism... Men who have had no knowledge of the written law of God, who have never even heard the name of Christ, have been kind to his servants, protecting them at the risk of their own lives. Their acts show the working of a divine power. The Holy Spirit has implanted the grace of Christ in the heart of the savage, quickening his sympathies contrary to his nature, contrary to his education. The light which lighteth every man that cometh into the world is shining in his soul, and this light, if heeded, will guide his feet all the way to the kingdom of God. Isn't that something? So we are told there will be people in heaven who will celebrate their first Sabbath in heaven. We are told there will be people in heaven who will look at the scars in Jesus' hands and they will say, what happened to that guy? They won't know Christ. They won't know anything about what we would call the plan of salvation. They will have never heard of the Sabbath and they were going to live forever. They're going to find out about all of it when they get there. Now, how does that work? Well, they, they went into a Christless grave, but a Christless grave does not mean you're lost. So, millions go into Christless graves because nobody shared with them the good news that Jesus wants to be your friend. But that doesn't mean they're going to miss out on eternity. He knows their hearts. He knows what would have happened if someone had introduced them to him. He knows their hearts in ways that we don't understand or know. And he says, if that person had just had an introduction, we would have been friends forever. So, we are friends forever. And I'll just meet, introduce myself to them when I see them next. You see. So, our prayers won't affect the adequate chance that God is determined to give every man and woman and boy and girl on this planet. Our prayers won't affect the adequate chance but there is a way 
that our prayers can make a difference in someone's life. I told you the story of Don praying for my son. There is a way that our prayers can make a difference in someone's life. Imagine somebody is hitchhiking. And um, imagine that they are trying to hitchhike to, let's say, the seminary. Andrews, Marion Springs. I picked that. That's going to represent a good place. Okay. And imagine that somebody else is hitchhiking. Well, let's, first of all, let's just go with the Andrews one. Okay, so this guy's hitchhiking to Andrews. And you come along and you say, uh, well, where are you going? Oh, he says, I'm going to Andrews University. And you say, actually, I'm going there too. I'll give you a ride if you want. He says, thank you very much, and he gets in your car. Now, because you stopped, he's going to get to Andrews quicker. But he would have gotten there anyway. It would just take him longer to get there. Now we'll take a different um, metaphor. Someone's hitchhiking to Las Vegas. <laughs> so you got the two contrasts here, right? And someone offers to give them a ride. They get there quicker, but they were headed there anyway. Either side of the coin, you can help someone farther along on the path they're traveling. But the path they're traveling is the path they're traveling. So how does that work? You can have a part in someone's eternity in the sense that you can get them hooked up with Jesus quicker. They would have found him sooner or later, but you can make it sooner instead of later. Now that's worth something, isn't it? That's worthwhile. That's worth tons. What you do doesn't decide whether or not they're going to be saved or lost, but it can get them saved sooner. And if you get them saved sooner, that's worthwhile. It's good to have a part. It gets me involved. Um, it brings blessings to me as well as to them. Which is why God gave man a part in the plan of salvation. I said he doesn't need us to finish the work, but every one of the four gospels ends with a gospel commission. Go to work. Well, if, if he doesn't need us to finish the work, then why does every gospel end with go to work? Interesting. We used to think it was because he was depending on us to get the job done. And so he repeats it four times to make sure that we get on it. But that's not the reason. He does not need us to finish the work, but we need to be involved for the benefit and blessing that brings us to be co-workers with Christ and with angels and with the Holy Spirit. There's a blessing in it. A minute ago I said that prayer can free God's hands. Now I'm going to say prayer can free me from my self-centeredness. When I begin praying for other people, amazing things start happening in my own life. Here's a little quotation from the book, Desire of Ages. God could have reached his object in saving sinners without our aid. Okay, so he doesn't need our help. But in order for us to develop a character like Christ's, we must share in his work. In order to enter into his joy, remember the joy of your Lord, he says, enter into the joy of your Lord. In order to enter into his joy, the joy of seeing souls redeemed. Okay, so in heaven, the thing that gives them the most joy is being able to help lost people find Christ. Heaven throws parties every time the lost are found. Amen. Jesus made that clear in his parables and in his stories. Lost and found. Parties every time. Parties. The lost son, the lost coin, the lost sheep. Oh, on and on it goes. Parties. In heaven, they just get so excited. Another one. We got another one. Raise the flag. Shoot off the fireworks. Let's get the choir. Let's sing a note higher. That's what they do in heaven. They get so excited about helping lost people find Jesus that they just, it's just like, whoo, isn't this great? This is so cool. The Lord gave me opportunity to introduce a world heavyweight kickboxing champion to Jesus. And um, he became a Christian and a lover of Christ. And uh, 
participated in that three-legged stool thing I was talking about, got to know Jesus more and more. And as he and Jesus became better and better friends, wonderful things were happening in his life. God was doing stuff, transforming his life. And people began hearing about the things that were going on in this kickboxer's life. And they said, wow, he's a different person than he used to be. Wouldn't it be cool to have him come and talk to us about these changes that are going on in his life? And so he started getting invited to go and talk to people about what was happening in his life since he had met Jesus. I went to hear him speak at a public high school to an entire auditorium full of people. It wasn't a church event. And he talked about Jesus and what Jesus meant to him. Just before the meeting started, I saw him praying off to the side. I didn't know he was praying. I saw him off by himself off to the side of the platform. I hadn't seen him for three or four years, so I ran over and I said, Hey, Steve. And then I realized he was crying. And I thought, Oh, man, are you okay? He said, Yeah, I'm okay. He said, I was just praying that before this meeting's over, when, when it's over, I was just praying that when the people leave here tonight, they won't be remembering Steve Mackey, the kickboxer. They'll be remembering Jesus Christ, the best friend you could ever have. He says, That's such a burden on my heart. It just moves me to tears as I pray for that. Well, that's what happens. When you pray like that kind of prayer, Jesus anoints what happens. And Holy Spirit was showing up in that high school auditorium, and it was just really cool to see what happened. Now, I was giving him a ride to the airport the next day. I said, you know, um, you're probably exhausted with jet lag and all the travels and everything else. If you want to just recline that chair and sleep, that's okay with me. And he said, sleep? Are you kidding me? I couldn't sleep. I could not sleep on the tail of watching people get excited about Jesus. All those people that came down for autographs afterwards, I'd say to them, what do you think I want you to remember more than anything else from tonight's presentation? They would say that Jesus wants to be my friend and he's the best friend I could ever have. He said, Lee, they got it. He said, there's nothing like it. He said, I've never had a rush like this in anything I've ever done. And he'd done some things that would give you a rush. I've never had a rush like this. He said to me, this could be addicting. <laughs> what was he describing? The joy of the Lord. This could be addicting. Helping lost people meet Jesus and shorten their time on the rough road of life without a Savior. It could be addicting. So, if we want to taste the joy of our Lord, we become involved in participating with Him in labors for their redemption. Steps to Christ, page 79. The effort to bless others will react in blessing upon who? Ourselves. This was the purpose of God in giving us a part to act in the plan of redemption. This is why every gospel ends with a commission. Because God wants us to taste the joy. Amen. He has granted men the privilege. You see, it's not a responsibility. It's not a duty. It's not an obligation. It's a privilege. The privilege of diffusing blessings to their fellow men. This is the highest honor and the greatest joy that it is possible for God to bestow upon men. It doesn't get any better than this. He's saying, you want to have as much joy as you can possibly have on this planet? Join my team in helping other people meet me sooner. And you won't find anything in life more meaningful than that. Do it in whatever capacity you find yourself presently living. Do it. Taste the joy. Albert Schweitzer is the one who said... <clears throat> This one thing I know, the only ones of you who will be truly happy are those who have sought and found how to serve. Everybody else who's just living for themselves, miserable, unhappy. Did you know that you can be a church member living for yourself and be miserable and unhappy? And when you are a miserable, unhappy church member, you have a way of making everybody around you miserable and unhappy too. Do you know it's possible to be thinking about Christianity simply because I want to get myself to heaven? That's a selfish reason. In fact, I'd even suggest to you that if just getting yourself to heaven is what's driving you, you probably aren't going to get there. 
Because heaven is about Jesus. And it's about having a friendship with him. And when you start getting to know Jesus, gold streets and no more death or dying become irrelevant. Because Jesus is everything. And you get so excited about his matchless charms that, you know, the things that used to motivate you, riding on a cheetah, <laughs> sliding down the neck of a giraffe, flying over the sea of glass, picking flowers that don't fade, eh, that would become boring after a while when you had all of eternity to do it with. But you know what's never going to get boring? is Jesus. He'll never be boring. You will never say, well, I'm thinking I'm kind of had, you know, learned all there is to know about this guy. No. There will always be more room to know and appreciate and love Jesus. And so the people who are simply serving themselves are the most miserable people, whether they're in churches or whether they're out of churches. And the people who are looking for ways to make life better for someone else are the people who are happiest. This is a principle that is true across the board, whether you believe in God or not. This is a principle that is true and is talked about by the advice columnists like Dear Abby and Ann Landers. They don't reference God. They just say to someone who says, woe is me, what kind of counsel do you have? They say, here's my counsel. You find someone who's worse off than you are. You go to work to make their life better, and you're going to lose track of your own misery, and you're going to become a happier person. And they don't say this is a biblical principle. They just say this is, wor this is what works. You do this. So when I become involved in interceding and praying for others and am concerned for other people, it frees me from the bondage of self. So that's another good reason. And it hastens their salvation, saving them years of unrest and sleepless nights. Have you read how large of an industry the sleeping pill industry is? It's amazing. Billions, multi-billions of dollars every year in North America just by people who have a hard time sleeping. You can save them from sleepless nights. Missionaries go to the native countries not because the natives won't be saved unless they do, but because they want to help them find salvation and save them from the witch doctor now. Now. Give them a leg up now. Bring them hope. Bring them happiness. Bring them peace now. So they can tell someone else too. Prayers are kind of like missionaries. That's kind of like missionaries. If someone is not appealing to the judge or the attorney or the mediator or the advocate and we begin praying for them, our prayers are kind of like missionaries. They kind of help people get it now, get it sooner. Sleepless nights disappearing sooner. So someone else can appeal the case and hasten salvation. Now I want to look at another passage. Prayer can free captives sooner. Look at another passage of scripture, book of Luke, chapter 11. Jesus said to them, suppose one of you has a friend and you go to him at midnight and you say to him, friend, lend me three loaves of bread for a friend of mine has arrived and I have nothing to set before him. And he answers from within, do not bother me. The door has already been locked and my children are with me in bed and I cannot get up and give you anything. I tell you, even though he will not get up and give him anything because he is his friend, at least because of his persistence, he'll get up and give him whatever he needs because he wants to go back to sleep and he's getting tired of the guy rapping on his door. Now, I just want to point something out before we unpack this parable as it applies to intercession. I want to point out that this parable directly precedes the famous verse about asking and seeking and finding. We have often taken asking, seeking, and finding out of context. And we've made it sound like, you know, you just ask for and seek and find whatever it is you're looking for. And if you just, you know, that, that's going to happen. But it's in the context of asking for something for somebody else that this phrase comes from. See, Seeking for something for somebody else. Finding something for somebody else. That's the context of the ask, seek, and find in verse 9. 
But let's sort of do a little hypothetical modern day example, all right? So you've got a friend who stops by and uh, for whatever good reason, your, your uh, cupboards are bare and your refrigerator is empty because you were maybe just getting ready to go on a long trip and you want to make sure you had nothing that was going to spoil or rot before you left and you were going to leave the next day and this unexpected visit, somebody shows up and um, you, have, you, know, you say, well, spend the night. Good to see you. Haven't seen you for a long time. And by the way, have, when's the last time you ate? And they say, well, you know, I haven't had anything uh, since breakfast. And here it is, uh, 1030 at night, 11 o'clock at night when they show up on your doorstep. You say, man, you must be starved. Everything's already shut down in this town. So you got this friend, hungry friend. Note that this is not a question of whether your guest or friend is going to starve to death. This is just a question of whether or not they're going to go to bed hungry. This person's life is not in your hands, but his comfort is. Think of this as the parable now, in the context of the parable. The man's life is not in anybody's hands, but his comfort is. We're not talking about eternal, eternal destiny here. We're talking about his comfort. His sleepless nights. Okay, so you go to your neighbor and you knock. You know it's late and he's already been, you know, in bed for hours, his lights off, but you knock. And you stay by the door knocking with a threefold argument. Your argument is number one, you have a friend in need. Do you have any friends in need? Do you have any loved ones in need? Threefold argument. So you have a friend in need. The second one is that um, the one on whose door you're knocking has what you need. So that's your second argument. I know he has it. I saw him coming home from the market just this afternoon with his bags full of groceries. I know he's got it. So you're not asking for things. You're asking for something for someone else. This is the safest kind of prayer you can expect an answer from God on. Safest kind. When you're asking for stuff for yourself. Hmm. Maybe, maybe not. But when you ask for something for somebody else in need, it's the safest prayer you can offer. You can pray expecting an answer. And there's one more point to this threefold argument. See, first of us, you have a friend in need. The second one was the one on whose door you're knocking has what's needed. And the third one is this. You are friends already with the neighbor you're knocking on. Did you catch that part of the story? What does he say to the man? He says, friend, lend me three loaves. He's talking to a friend he's already become friends he's already experiencing the three-legged stool with Jesus there's a friendship going on and that's why he has courage to knock at midnight you have a friend with whom you are on speaking terms now let's notice once more the sequence in the parable you have an urgent need for someone else you have a willing love even though time is inconvenient, you have a sense of helplessness. You don't know what they need. You don't have what they need. You're helpless. You have faith in prayer to God. You know who to turn to or to go. And you have a persistent spirit because of the love that Jesus has put in your heart. As you spend time with Jesus on that three-legged stool, as you spend time with the source of love, you become filled with his love. And when you're filled with the love of Jesus, it has a way of stirring you for others. It's a gift that he gives you. You don't get this just by saying, well, by George, I'm going to start being concerned about others. From this day forward, I'm going to be concerned about others. No, that is the byproduct of being, spending time with Jesus. You must spend time with a source of love before you begin caring for people, really caring, unselfishly caring for people. HMS Richard Sr., the founder of the Voice of Prophecy radio broadcast, which was operating out of Glendale, California, 
Uh, when I was in second, third, and fourth grade, our family lived in Glendale, California. And if you don't know about Glendale, Glendale is just one of the masses of cities that are all blended together, unbroken. They call it Los Angeles. It uh, stretches it's hundreds of square miles of city. Just <laughs> And we just lived about a mile and a half from HMS Richard Sr. And we used to see him walking to the Voice of Prophecy radio broadcast to work. He'd walk down the sidewalk. He'd always be reading a little pocket New Testament. He knew, I guess he just had done this so many years, walked so, he, knew, he knew where he was without looking down. He's just counting, you know, his steps or something in his mind. He'd come to a end of a sidewalk, you know, and he'd st stop for a moment. And then he'd step down and walk across and go up again, you know, just reading his Bible with only one good eye. So he had to hold it up to the one eye. We used to see him. I remember seeing him with his little beret hat on, his long black coat. I'm being driven to school, and I see him walking to the Voice of Prophecy radio broadcast. Well, there were a few hills right around the subdivisions where we lived that just went up into sagebrush, kind of empty, dry, dusty hills. And my dad used to like to go up on those hills and go walking, exercising, get off of the streets and away from the combust, you know, the hustle and bustle. And one evening after dark, he was up there walking, my dad, in the hills. And he came across HMS Richards up in the hills too. He was sitting on a rock. And my dad said, oh, it's a beautiful view. What brings you up here? A little exercise? He says, no, I was praying for Los Angeles. Praying for Los Angeles. And my dad said, really? He said, why? My dad said, why are you praying for I mean, That's a big city. Why are you praying for it? He said, I can't help it. I just can't help it. See, it really doesn't matter whether everybody in Los Angeles responds because of the prayer. He's not praying for answers. He's praying because his heart is so filled with love and yearning for these people to meet his friend Jesus that he can't help but pray. He's just going to pray anyway. Just going to pray anyway. And the final little point as we summarize that passage of scripture we just looked at was you're certain of the reward because your friend has loaves and he owns the cattle on a thousand hills. Also has extensive mining in, in, you know, uh, interests. You know somebody that you can ask because you're already friends with him. And you have another friend that needs what he has to, to give. You want to link your friends together. That's what friends are for, you know? Something good happens to you, you want to share it with your friends. You celebrate with your friends. You, you pass it on to your friends. You tell your friends. That, that's what friends are all about. It's not a duty or an obligation. It's just what happens when you have relationships that matter and are meaningful to you. So let me tell you the rest of the story about Dr. Ted, the physician who showed up in church after 20 years. Uh, my little girl, Lindsay, who I've referred to here already, um, she was five years old at the time. And in the middle of the night, one night, Lindsay woke up screaming in pain. And those of you who are parents, and you can remember an occasion where one of your children was hurting, you know how desperate you feel to want to do something to help, you know. Lindsay's just writhing on her bed in agony and screaming. You know there's a difference between a scream of anger or a tantrum and a scream of pain, you know. And you know, This is the middle of the night. She's been awakened and she's in horrible pain. Little five-year-old, little five-year-old girl. And we try to talk to her, you know, Lindsay, what's wrong, what's wrong? <coughs> My ear. She's having this ear earache. The earache is so bad that she's writhing in pain. I'm thinking, what do I do? What do you, you know, I can't even, you know, you can't get inside of a ear of a five-year-old. Um, you know, I'm, I'm frantic. Margie and I are just frantic. We're, you know, we're, oh, we pick her up. She doesn't quit screaming. We set her down. She doesn't quit screaming. We, we, 
get a cold rag with ice on it and put it against her ear, but she doesn't quit screaming. She's just writhing and tears are streaming down her little cheeks and you want to do anything you can to help this little five-year-old stop hurting. You know, tears are going down our cheeks. It's the middle of the night. There's nothing open. You know, where are we going to go? And even if there was something open, what would we get? What do we, we don't know what's wrong. We don't know how to fix it. We're, you know, and I got out the phone book. And I found Dr. Ted's home phone number. It's 2 o'clock in the morning. And I called Dr. Ted. I had the courage to ask him for help because my daughter's need was so great that I couldn't not ask him for help. I love somebody in need and I couldn't remain quiet. It would have been harder for me to not dial his number than to run the risk of waking him up at the middle of the night. You see? Harder for me to remain quiet. I couldn't fix it myself, but I knew somebody who could. And so I called him in the middle of the night. And Dr. Ted said, meet me in my clinic. I'll be there in five minutes. I grabbed Lindsay. I held her in my arms as I drove her to the clinic with one hand shifting. She's screaming the whole time. I'm crying. I get to the clinic. Dr. Ted is waiting at the door in his pajamas. <laughs> he opens the door. We walk into the clinic. He gets out his little scope, looks into her ear. He says, I see the problem. He says, look, Lee, look here. I look in and I see the inflammation and the infection. He says, this is um, no wonder she's crying. He gets some numbing medicine, turns her head over to this side and then drops drops into her ear. He says, the membrane's going to start getting numb and she's going to feel less pain in just a few moments. And there as we talked together for a few moments, Lindsay stopped crying. And then she went to sleep, back to sleep right there lying on that paper-covered little adjustable examination table. And I said, Dr. Ted, thank you. Thank you for letting me disturb you in the middle of the night. And he said, it was a privilege. Don't think twice about disturbing. It was a privilege. Do you love somebody in need? Do you know somebody who can help? It is a privilege to pray for them. And he considers it a privilege to answer your prayer. And so, Luke 11 says, If you then, though you are sinful, the way he wraps the story up, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who are asking Him? Christ's object lesson says, never will one be told, I cannot help you. Those who beg at midnight for loaves to feed the hungry souls will always be successful. Isn't that wonderful? So pray, pray, pray. Jesus invited us to. That's a good enough reason all by itself. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, we're so glad that you have loaves and that we can come to you on behalf of people that we care about, people that matter to us, people that are in need, people who are hurting. We can talk to you about that and that you are eager to get involved and that when we bring their need to your attention and you get involved the accuser of the brethren the prosecutor is powerless to argue that it's unfair for you to be there because you can say I'm just answering prayer I suppose if there's one thing that we should confess it should that be that we have we've been praying too little we have asked for too few loaves or others. So stir us deeply. Um, 
draw us into a deeper and closer walk with you. May that three-legged stool be the experience of every one of us here on a daily basis as we meet with you. Uh, fill us with fresh bread from the table and uh, like the disciples of old, give us enough loaves and fishes that we can pass them on to others. Thank you for the peace that comes to our own hearts when we think about the fact that you are the life giver and that you have made yourself responsible to be the light that lights every man who comes into the world. Thank you that um, you love everybody on this planet more than we do and that you're not going to leave any stone unturned to give them an adequate chance. It's going to be a real exciting experience someday. To be with that host, that great host that no man can number in the heavenly country and meet people who get introduced to you there for the first time. What a wonderful God you are, able to save to the guttermost. And thank you for offering that salvation to each one of us here tonight. In Jesus' name, amen.